Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. We're going to get started. We have uh, quite a few things we want to cover today. So, um, just hi, I'm Eileen. I am the chair of the Library Diversity Committee, um, who's sponsoring this presentation today. Um, just, just a little bit of housekeeping information. Um, restrooms are over in Fine Arts, so you go across the elevator lobby, lobby turn left. And there, that's where the restrooms are. If in the case of emergency, and we know we won't have one, but in case there is, the emergency exit would be by <coughs> this door to your right, the second door down. So it's really easy to get to, and we'll just walk on downstairs. Um, and I think that's it. So <coughs> this is Scott Seale, <coughs> Dean of the Library. Hi, everybody. Well, welcome to all the library. And um, it's a pleasure for me to introduce to all of you Professor William Condy. Now, Professor Condy is Hamilton Baker and Hostetler Professor of Humanities here at Ohio University School of Interdisciplinary Arts. Uh, his work is in theater. And his most recent book is Coal and Culture, Opera Houses in Appalachia. But He's also author of numerous art articles and several um, on Southeast Asian publication. And um, he's here today to give a talk and a performance, and that's going to be titled Confessions of a Left-Handed DeLong, Adventures in Balinese Puppetry. So please welcome. such a wonderful, wonderful turnout. I'm glad you could all come uh, on such a joyous day. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and so I'm going to be talking for a little while about Balinese puppetry. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to try to keep that short and then move on to, to, to do a puppet show. Um, so the first confession I have is I'm not left-handed. <laughs> I apologize to all the South Paws in the audience for purporting to be what I am not. Uh, but what I wanted to get at with that title is issues that I have with puppetry in relationship to uh, my own feelings of, of um, distance and difficulty in encountering uh, and, uh, Balinese culture, my own senses of, of uh, inadequacy, uh, questioning my own existence as a Dalang. The word Dalang, as I'll explain more, means puppet master, uh, questioning whether I'm really a puppet master or not. This specific reference to left-handedness has to do with um, issues, as many of you may know, that in uh, Southeast Asia, as in many cultures, um, it is use of the use of the left hand it can be um, impolite, can be disrespectful, and so to give and receive should always happen with the right hand. Um, the pointing, especially with the left hand, would be a very uh, improper, impolite, disrespectful thing to do. Uh, so my use of left handed here has to do again with my own. Uh, um, uh, um, mistakes and the many mistakes that I will make today uh, in trying to uh, describe uh, the Balinese culture, Balinese art, and Balinese puppetry. Specifically, I often tell my students a story of my first trip to Bali. I was visiting the friend of uh, house of my good friend Sadana, uh, Inyoman Sadana, who is in Indiana right now at Butler University directing a production of Midsummer Night's Dream there. And I was visiting their uh, house where they have a, had a lovely temple in the corner of their house. I was visiting there on a, uh, a very important holiday, Kunigan, and we they were, were, decorate, were decorating the house, much as we would, might decorate the house for Christmas. So we're decorating the, the temple and the house with all kinds of beautiful bamboo ornaments. And I was sitting outside on the steps with Sani, um, Sani of C, the, uh, the um, Sadana's wife, and we're making these, the children are there, and I'm looking at their beautiful temple, and I say, there's a one aspect of it which I found interesting. So I said, Sunit, what's that 
up at the top of your of the shrine right there. Can you explain to me what's at the top of the shrine? And she said, I, I don't know what you're talking about. And I said, right there. <laughs> that thing right there that I'm pointing at with my left hand <laughs> and polite. And she said, I don't know what you're There, Sunny, don't you see? And finally, very politely, Sunny is a beautiful and lovely, kind woman, said, Bill, please do not point at our shrine, and please do not use your left hand. <laughs> and so I learned something of, uh, on, on that day about um, the, the, the delicacy with which I need to approach these subjects and, uh, and the many mistakes that I uh, make. So that's the kind of behind uh, the story of this. So, uh, let's talk about um, the puppetry. Um, first, what is it and why is it important? Um, Balinese Wayang Kulit is a form of um, shadow puppetry that, uh, that uses flat leather puppets that you'll see here um, using a light projected onto a screen. So you're basically watching the shadows of it there. Um, and we'll talk about that in more detail. So why is this interesting? It's interesting on a lot of reasons. First of all, it defies all of our Western notions of theater. Everything we know about theater in the West is wrong in regard to Polynesian theater. When I went there for the first time, I discovered that things I had been teaching to Ohio University students for 15 years about definition of theater and what is theater was wrong. <laughs> We're not necessarily wrong, but inadequate, incomplete. So for example, and I'll explain these things in more detail later, there is no audience in the way that we understand an audience in the West. A lot of the performance happens in a language that the human audience cannot understand. The performance lasts four or five hours in Bali, up to nine or 10 hours in Java. There is only one performer who, who is the playwright, who is the director and manipulates literally hundreds of puppets. The audience comes and goes, eats and drinks, sleeps, talks, etc. The first time when I was in um, Java, in, in Solo, um, I was watching a, a performance with a, a, a friend of mine, um, Javanese, we were watching the performance. And we're talking, as people do during these performances. And he said to me, I've heard about your theater in the West. He said, now let me just get this straight. So what you do is you sit in the dark. <laughs> and you just sit in a chair. And you don't talk. <laughs> and you don't eat. And you don't drink. And you don't smoke. And the people on stage just talk. And he shook his head sadly, like, what would be the interest in that? Why would one possibly be interested in seeing something like that? What is the point of that? Um, so part of it is, it, it flies in the face of everything we think we know about theater. But secondly, it's of course important in its own right. Um, it is, this is one of the most ancient and important forms of storytelling in, in the world. This is a storytelling tradition that goes back uh, at least a thousand years and probably longer. It's also pervasive all across Bali and Java. One of the reasons I was attracted to Indonesian puppet theater, and I've traveled um, and blessed the, the Southeast Asian program here that's been very generous in providing me uh, support for, for, for travel there and learn about this theater in order to come back and teach students here at Ohio University. But many forms of, of puppetry in Southeast Asia are performed essentially for old people and tourists. Um, and they are not really thriving and vibrant forms of the culture today. In Java and Bali, that's not true. These are, puppet, these are plays that, that everybody goes to see, that people love. Um, one, of the, one Western writer talks about how that in Java and Bali, the, um, that Wayang is as much of a pervasive metaphor as, as baseball is in America. So for baseball in America, we use baseball as a metaphor for anything and everything in life similarly in Java and Bali for, for Wyong. 
Um, it also is a way in which the past and the present come together. Tradition and contemporary issues join up in this kind of, kind of performance. Um, it also is very much related to religion and all, many aspects of religion. It's related to, to uh, it, so issues of animism are very important here. A lot of part of the performance, both in Java and Bali, Java, of course, being predominantly uh, uh, Muslim, uh, Bali being predominantly Hindu, but in both cases, a very important part of it is having offerings for the gods. And these performances take place not just as entertainment, um, but really as, for for, as a part of a devotional event. Um, and especially they're done at transitional times. And transitions are often seen as something that are dangerous. So any kind of transition, they're susceptible to danger. The spirits can get in. Evil spirits can, get, can, can, can be active at times of transition and, and do mischief. So therefore, it's important to do these rituals, do these transitions, these, these, these ceremonies in order to ease through those periods of transition. There also is a strongly mystical aspect to this. Um, insofar as the performances have this kind of ritualistic devotional function. Um, and the Dalong, the puppet master, serves as a kind of a, a medium between a broker between the natural and the supernatural. There are also Hindu aspects to it. As I mentioned, Bali is predominantly Hindu, that, and the texts come from the uh, Mahabharata and the Ramayana, uh, Sanskrit texts from India that involve um, Hindu uh, gods. And the Dalang, again looking at it from, from this Hindu aspect, serves almost as a kind of priestly role. In addition to that, uh, in Java there is a strong relationship to Islam. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, skip over that for today because I want to focus mainly on the, the Balinese um, form. Uh, these are some of, I'm, I'm sorry, you can, we have, I'm blocking. Um, so you know, these are some of the puppets. You'll see them uh, 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 more closely in a moment. The puppets are ritually significant. Um, there are offerings made to the puppets uh, several times a year. A full collection would consist of about 100 to 150. They're made of flattened, cured leather. Um, the characters are, are, are uh, cut in profile. Uh, they're with fine chisels and then highly painted. They're manipulated by one main stick controlling the body, and then usually two sticks for, uh, for the hands. Um, the central puppet, the Kionan, you can see here, um, is the, uh, the puppet that kind of frames the action. It symbolizes, in a sense, the tree of life, but can also serve as a puppet representing sea, forest, wind, rain, fire, uh, etc. The stage itself, you can actually see one right here. This is a, one that was built uh, by Dan Denhart in the School of Theater, um, according to specifications uh, from my friend in, in Bali. The puppet is usually, the stage is set up in, a, in an area usually uh, um, adjacent to a temple, but not in the innermost part of the temple, though we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, there's a, uh, a screen here, there's then a banana log right here, and the puppets are stuck into the banana log. Banana logs are wonderful because um, they have a thick skin, so you can pop the stick into them, but then it's a very porous uh, interior so that, that it'll hold it well. And also the, uh, the banana logs are self-healing um, so, uh, so that you pull them out and it, and it will heal over. Um, it's hard to find pup, uh, banana logs here in Athens, Ohio, <laughs> with, the, with, the, with the great um, funding from Southeast Asian studies. We've been able to, we've got our own uh, plantation. We regularly cut them down and uh, <laughs> um, The lamp in, 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 in Bali, in Java, it's usually nowadays an electric light. Um, in Bali, they use an oil lamp. Uh, which is beautiful because it creates this flickering light. The wind is blowing. It creates this flickering so that the puppets really come to life uh, as, as they move in and out of focus. It also is very exciting um, to have this uh, so that this, the wick is um, not quite as big as like this, but it's maybe like that big around. So it's this big wick 
with this big flame coming out of it that's right above your head um, <laughs> this. and also periodically then they have to add more oil to it uh, during it so while you're performing oil is being poured into it also it usually has a leak so oil is dripping down onto you um, and then sometimes during fight scenes by mistake especially if one is a left-handed dalang um, one might hit the uh, lamp and so sparks go flying everywhere. <laughs> Meanwhile, so spark while well, you're covered in oil, sparks yeah. are coming out. Um, one performance I gave, I had to put out a fire in the middle of it. Thank you, Eileen, for letting us know when the fire exits are. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here you can see uh, 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 setting up for a performance with the dalang um, and getting the, the light uh, ready for it. Um, and uh, this is accompanied throughout by a by musicians, um, a gamelan ensemble, percussion instruments. Um, usually, it's about four musicians, as you can see here. It's smaller uh, gamelan in in Bali than it is in, in Java. The music is complex, hypnotic, beautiful. Um, the Dalang, as I mentioned before, is the puppet master, the playwright, the director, the actor, and must be ready to perform up to 100 or 150 performances at a moment's notice. Um, there is a, a shamanistic aspect to the Dalang. The Dalang is a kind of a spiritual leader, as I mentioned before, a link between the human world and the spiritual world. The Dalang, in a sense, becomes a kind of inspired priest when he is performing. And I, most often, dalangs are male, uh, though there are some female dalangs. In fact, a, one, uh, a student from interdisciplinary arts, Jennifer Goodlander, wrote her dissertation on uh, female dalangs in, in Bali. A fascinating topic. Gender issues are fascinating. So the dalang has this ability to mediate between the three realms of the earth, the sky, and the underworld. Um, and the dalang has to have this and have, um, have, have these kinds of abilities, to have the contact with these metaphysical powers. But the Dalang also serves an important community function as a community advisor, an educator, and a learned person. People often turn to the Dalang for, for advice. So the term can also be used metaphorically to mean someone who is the mastermind, the power behind the scenes, the godlike mastermind of the performance. Some of these have a, some Dalangs have a kind of superstar quality. Uh, Cheng Long in, in Bali. Um, every, whenever I was there, and I would I mentioned to people that I was studying, uh, studying um, uh, puppetry, um, they, would, uh, they would mention Cheng Long uh, and ask me if I knew him. And I can tell you, I gave a lecture at the uh, Hindu Dharma Institute in Denpasar, and one of the most terrifying moments was as I was about to speak, come up and give my speech, someone pointed out to me that Cheng Long was sitting there in the first <laughs> row. So here I am lecturing to Cheng Long about, about, um, uh, about, about puppetry. The Dalang sits cross-legged um, behind the screen. When I get to performing shortly, you will notice I do not sit cross-legged. I cannot sit cross-legged. <laughs> um, I did when I was in Bali. Um, but it's painful, uh, and so I, I don't. I use a little stool here. My teacher doesn't know this. <laughs> um, then sits cross-legged, hitting with a mallet um, uh, that's in one mallet in the hand, one mallet in the toes, banging against a, a, a puppet box for for percussion. Surrounded by puppets with assistants, and you'll see I'm ably assisted by some wonderful assistants today. Um, uh, performing this. Um, so here you can see, it's very hard to get good photos during performance because it's happening at nighttime um, with the lights. With the so this is my teacher, um, Pak Tunjung, uh, at a performance he was giving. Um, we can question whether this person is a Dalang or not. <laughs> um, you can see my teacher, Tun Jung, in the background there. Uh, he's not particularly pleased. <laughs> <laughs> the night before I gave that performance, I was mentioning that we had a dress rehearsal the night before the performance, mm -hmm. and Pak Tunjun said to me, Now, Mr. Bill, 
many of my teachers will be at the performance tomorrow. <laughs> I hope you do not embarrass me. <laughs> um, the texts come from, as I mentioned before, from the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, Sanskrit texts from, from India. But there then a lot of the performance happens in Kawi. Kawi is an is of ancient Javanese, and nobody understands it. <laughs> But that's okay, because the gods understand it. The ancestors understand it. The spirits understand it. So if you don't understand it, that doesn't matter, for reasons I'll get to in a moment. But then the clowns come on, and the clowns translate. So in Bali, they would translate into Balinese. So they'll come on and say, this is what they just said. This is what they're talking about. And so when, uh, so when I perform here, I translate uh, into <laughs> Thank you. Um, the, the, the clouds serve a fascinating function in a kind of liminal space, mediating between the performance and the audience, mediating between gods and humans, uh, and they have a free space to comment on society, on politics, on the audience, um, serving almost as a kind of a fool character, um, cutting across class structure with a lot of horseplay, with a lot of jokes, with a lot of sexual jokes, a lot of scatological jokes, and so forth. For example, Twelve, <coughs> who you'll see performed soon, is one of the clowns, one of the servants. He's a fat buffoon who is the servant to the Panduas, but he is also the elder brother of Shiva, the greatest of the gods. So therefore, he is simultaneously more powerful than the gods themselves. That's what's fascinating about the clowns. The performance in Bali typically begins about 9 p.m., lasts until about 1 o'clock in the morning. The performance structure is quite flexible. Um, there, there is a structure to it, but the Dalang is able to improvise and, and, and create and within, that, within that structure. Um, so that battle scenes can be shortened or lengthened, joking scenes can be shortened or lengthened, and so forth. The performance begins with a, a, an overture in effect from the gamelan, then a dance of the kayonan, the leaf-shaped puppet that you'll see then in a few minutes. Um, in many cases, little happens during the performance. There's a wonderful story of Ward Keeler, an anthropologist, um, who was watching a performance, and for about two hours, it didn't seem like anything was happening. And so he turned to his translator and said, what's going on? And his translator said, nothing. <laughs> so if you think about this, that this is the length of time of a Western performance, two hours, in which everything is supposed to happen. And in Java, you can have two hours in which nothing happens. And that's okay. Because if, you, if you're bored, you leave. You go to sleep. One time outside of um, Bandung, I was watching a performance in which the mayor of the town arrived. I was for a wedding. Um, and they were all very, they were, um, they were bit impressed that the mayor came. Everyone told me what a, what a, how much the mayor loved Wyong. Um, and it was so, they were so proud that he had come there because he loved Wyong and he was honoring this wedding by being there and so forth. They, everyone else was sitting in plastic chairs. They brought out an upholstered, leather upholstered sofa for him to sit in. They take pictures. Of course, they brought me and I sit next to the mayor and have a lot of pictures taken so on and so forth. The performance got started. Within 10 minutes, he was sound asleep. <laughs> and I don't mean just, you know, nodding. I mean, you know, head jerking, <laughs> drooling, <laughs> out cold. And that was OK. That was OK, because he was there. <laughs> in no way was this an insult or, or uh, dishonor in any way whatsoever. Um, the audience. Most of the audience watches from the, from the shadow side, um, watches the shadows here. Um, in, in, in Bali, the Dalang will often be in a kind of booth that will keep the audience from watching. But still, many people come around and sneak in and pull the curtains <laughs> aside because they want to see the Dalang. They want to see the puppets. And in fact, in Java, almost all the audience watches from the Dalang side. In fact, I've seen performances in which the screen is put up against a wall. And so there is no shadow side. Because um, people are really interested in watching the puppets, watching the Dalang, watching the, the, the mastery of this, and so forth. Um, 
There's a scholar, A.J. Becker, who talks about the audience, and he, he describes it in what he refers to as the essential audience and the inessential audience. The inessential audience is you. You don't need to be there. You don't matter. The essential audience is the gods, the spirits, the ancestors, the unseen. And that's why it's okay to perform in Kawi, because they understand it. If you don't understand it, and the beginning of the performance really is about a kind of a prayer to this essential audience. So a performance of Wyong is really a social experience. The atmosphere is festive, the atmosphere is chaotic. Again, people are coming and going, eating, drinking, sleeping, gambling. Um, uh, um, and, and so it's really, it's about being in the midst of a group of people. Everybody in the village knows everybody else, and so it's a kind of community gathering. You know, think, uh, think, you know, the, the farmer's market. Um, another scholar talked about this, actually it's Becker also, describing what he refers to as it being the attention of the audience being non-compulsive. I think it's a nice way of thinking about this, non-compulsive. In a sense, in Western theater, our attention is compulsive. There's nothing else to look at but this <laughs> lit stage in front of you. It's all dark. The walls of the theater are usually in America. They're, you know, boring. Um, there's nothing to. It's almost like we're ho horses with blinders on, and there's nothing to look at from. Them. So that's a kind of compulsive attention. In Bali and in Java, the attention is not compulsive. If you don't want to pay attention, don't pay attention. I think it's not about you anyway. <laughs> that also means that as you are coming and going, each person creates his or her own narrative by what you watch. So there's something in a sense very postmodern about it. It isn't that there is this strict storyline that you need to follow. You pick and choose your story by when you come and go, by when you are awake, when, by when you are paying attention, et cetera, et cetera. So if it's an interesting scene, you watch. If it's a boring scene, you go to sleep. Um, and much of the interaction is what it's about. As one scholar said, watching Wyong is not about watching Wyong. Another scholar, uh, not writing about about um, uh, uh, Wyong specifically, but I think is a helpful phrase, refers to it as selective inattention. Selective inattention. The idea that you pay attention when you want to, you don't pay attention when you don't want to. So the audience, um, if you fall asleep, you're not missing anything. The pleasure, as one scholar wrote, lies in the disfocus. Disfocus. So these happen, as I mentioned, as part of a broader um, Hindu ceremony. Um, the community comes together for this, for a wedding, for a birth, for a village cleansing, um, et cetera. Uh, this is a picture of a, um, offerings in a temple. Um, this was a procession coming up to a temple with a suckling pig here. Um, uh, he was sacrificed shortly after this picture. Well, I love this picture because it gives a sense of the, 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 the trance like quality of this. Um, it's filled with amazing offerings. Everything that you're seeing here is part of a pig um, that are that cut into pieces and made as this decoration, this offering. There are also dancers who are performing, um, topang mask dance. So the, the performance happens in the context of all of this. Um, Stephen Lansing, uh, an author I like very much, writes about this as being a way, trying to understand the context of this, refers to it as, as that in Bali there are three worlds. There is the middle world, that's the world we see right now, the world of humans. But it's also a world of illusion, Maya. But that middle world is influenced by the upper world of gods, ancestors, these are the forces of growth, also then influenced by the lower world, the world of demons, the world of dissolution. And so the middle world comes into existence out of the agreement between the other worlds. These other worlds shape the world that we see. So success in our world consists of keeping those other worlds in balance. So the temple, then, is a kind of a link between the human world and the unseen worlds. 
The veil of Maya, the veil of illusion, is lifted briefly during these ceremonies. So the temple becomes a place where these three worlds intersect. And the purpose of the festival then is to accommodate all three worlds, the gods, the humans, and the demons. Each one has their own desires, and all of them have to be met. So if the accommodations are successful, if compromises are made between these three worlds, then the ceremony is successful. And it, but it then has to be renewed every cycle. And, and then the temple is deserted 